In a world where 85% of employees report feeling disengaged at work and job stress costs U.S. businesses up to $300 billion annually, workplace resilience is not just timely but crucial for your financial well-being. Today's episode will delve into the symbiotic relationship between workplace resilience and your financial health. We'll explore emerging trends and discuss how resilience can be your secret weapon in navigating these turbulent times. Let's roll into the intro. Welcome to another episode of the Dapper Dolls podcast, where we answer your finance questions, but a bit with style. I'm Anir Bond, and we also have George as your host for the show. So George, what are we talking about today? Well, according to a recent study by Gallup, only 20% of US employees strongly agree that they are managed in a way that motivates them to do outstanding work, which directly impacts their resilience and consequently their financial decisions. Furthermore, a report by PwC indicates that financially stressed employees are 2.2 times more likely to seek a new job opportunity underscoring the link between workplace resilience and financial stability. But what does that mean to you? How can you navigate the complexities of workplace dynamics to not just survive, but thrive financially? Before we introduce our guest for today, we want to make sure you like this episode, subscribe to our podcast. That would help boost our algorithm that presents this to viewers just like you. So Anna Bren, who are we chatting with today? Today we have Nisi Duran. Nisi was most recently the head of strategy and operations for YouTube marketing across the Latin America and Canada markets. She's had many years of experience across other notable companies such as Google, McKinsey and Company, and Nike. Unfortunately, she was part of the recent tech layoffs due to economic conditions. Even though she had faced a tough situation, Nisi bounced back by starting a successful podcast show called One of a Kind, where she connects with individuals discussing various topics surrounding resilience in the most authentic and funny way. We're very happy to have Nisi on our show. Welcome, Nisi. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So Nisi, as you know, we like to start our episode with a short game. This time we'll ask you with a set of rapid fire questions so we can gauge your interests. Are you ready for me to fire away? Yes, go for it. All right. Favorite city you visited? Barcelona. Ooh, that's on my list. <laughs> uh, a hobby you picked up during quarantine? I didn't pick up any hobbies. Everyone was doing, I know, everyone was doing... Um, bread. And I just, I didn't have the patience for it. I tried one time and I gave up. So I think my hobby would probably be working out more during the pandemic. That's a good one. I can say that. <laughs> Better than carbs. <laughs> that's true. That's true. The opposite. <laughs> uh, the first app you check when you wake up. News, unfortunately. It should be something more fun, but I really want to know what's going on in the news. <laughs> Any sort of news apps. <laughs> <laughs> Best piece of advice you've ever received. This came from a colleague when I was at McKinsey. We were in a training session together for three weeks. And he said he only got to really know me halfway through. So he told me to let my freak flag fly. And that was the best <laughs> advice I ever got. That was a good one. Yeah. Cool. So can you start by telling us about your journey for being an almost lawyer? What most people actually don't know about going on your profile, you have a JD from Columbia Law School. So how did you go from being an almost lawyer to a former Googler and now you are a podcast host? I, I think you know that journey is interesting. We'd like to know more. It's confusing, right? <laughs> like, what were you doing? So I, I went to undergrad at Cornell. Um, I was the first person in my family to go to college and it was really far away from my family. So I had to get used to being on my own and also being around people that didn't have my life experiences. But after I kind of got over that initial hump, I really just fell in love with school. And I like the idea of being completely immersed in the education and having new experiences and building really deep relationships while I was there. So it made me fall in love with the East Coast, right? And then when I um, graduated from Cornell, I went to Oregon. So I went back West uh, to work for Nike for a couple of years. And after a couple of years being there, I knew that I wanted to get some kind of graduate degree. And I was debating between business school and law school. And I just, I fell in love with the idea of law, <laughs> the idea that you would be creating essentially the governing principles that a society lives by. And you can also use law as a tool to change people's lives in a positive way. You know, if something is not providing the types of opportunities equally to everyone, like how can we use law as a lever for that? So I was very idealistic <laughs> and I did want to go back East and Columbia was a, a great opportunity to kind of land there. I wanted to be in New York city I couldn't have done that right under undergrad because I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> but once I had a couple of years experience, I thought I could handle New York and I loved it. 
what I would say that I, um, the reason I pivoted away from it was once I had actual legal jobs in the field, like I had a couple of internships working in big tech, some, I don't know for anybody that is a lawyer, they'll understand this, but you know, transactional law, contractual, um, also some appellate experience, just trying to get a variety of different legal exposure. I came to the conclusion that even though I loved studying the law and what that meant, actual application of it, if I wanted to pay off my student loans, you know, talking about finance, I was going to probably have to go into big tech and that's not what was exciting for me. And then when I took a step back, I realized that life is all about solving problems. Every day you have problems, right? And so someone also told me at some point, like, what kind of problems do you want to have every day? That's sort of like the secret to life, right? Deciding that. And I realized from a career perspective, I found business problems more interesting and exciting than legal problems, just because you could probably solve them more quickly. Um, and there's not as much room for being idealistic. You kind of have to live in reality, right? So that's why I did, did end up not being a lawyer. I loved my time at law school. I loved it. I still think it's the people that I met there that are probably kind of like the brightest people I've ever met. And some people that are really doing really great work to change our daily lives. Um, but so that's why I pivoted there. And then after that, I went into McKinsey and then into tech. I was in tech for nine years before I was laid off, as you all mentioned. And how did I become a, a host? <laughs> um, I think I was pretty devastated when I got laid off. I was very, very, very devastated. A lot of my identity was tied up into Google, YouTube specifically. And for some reason, I just had this urge inside of me to get it all documented somehow and to work through my feelings. And when I started doing that, it resonated with people and other people wanted to share their stories too. So that's where I am today. So now we're getting into the talk about the podcast. And so what inspired you to start that? Because it sounded like you were using this more of like a diary, but it's also for people to listen out in the public. So like, how does it align with you having the love for meaningful conversations? And then, but for something so personal that you went through? It's a really good question. I was reflecting on this too. Why did I do this? Because it's scary. It's a lot of work, as you all know, having a podcast, is a lot of work, but it's also very scary because you're, you're not pretending to be anybody else, right? In theory, you're yourself. And to put yourself out there like that to strangers, I think is a very scary thing, at least, at least for me, maybe not for everyone. Right. But I think I've mentioned it a little bit. I would say that I was in such a dark place just to be totally transparent. I was shocked when I got laid off. Um, I'd always been a really strong performer and I had really strong connections with everyone at work. And I believed in the company so much. I'd given so much to them that I just didn't think it was a possibility. <laughs> and so coming to terms with why it hit me so hard, I thought, actually talking out loud. And I did, I did the first episode with my brother. So I felt very safe doing that. Um, and then I think there's something about telling your story out loud to somebody else and then having a chance to listen to it again in a recording that for me personally, I've learned so much about myself as well. And you, you say things sometimes out loud that you don't realize you're even feeling or thinking. So I think that was my motivation. You know, I love, I love people. Um, that's one of the things that I miss most about work, having my daily interactions with the people that I can coach and also be coached by them. And so creating this podcast was a way for me to hold on to some of that. Cause I have interviewed a lot of my friends who are still at Google or at other places. And so, and what they've told me too, is when we've had these sessions, they have, they get these light, what is it called? Light bulb moments where they put together these five experiences that they had throughout their life. And they realize something about themselves. So I think it's really beautiful. I think the purpose of life, at least for me, is connecting with people. Like I, I truly believe that. And this is allowing me to do that. And then people that listen to our conversations hopefully can learn about themselves too. I agree. And speaking of listening, so when I do, one thing I really do enjoy is how how you sort of lead with like your examples. I like how open and forthcoming you are with like your life stories. And, you know, I think it has like a like a catalyst effect on your guests because they start to open up and they speak more. And I was like, wow, that's just such a good skill to have. And so I guess if you could kind of break down for us and for our listeners, um, what is workplace resilience? And in the sense that like you've had an experience in working in diverse industries, is that something you can speak on and share as a perspective as well? I'll make a comment about what you said before, then I'll answer your question. I think that is something that I've been accused of, of you make people feel so comfortable that then we tell you things and we forget it's being recorded, but I, I you know <laughs> it's not on purpose, but I just, I really care. I really believe in authentic conversations and I want to be as open as I possibly can. But sometimes I do get nervous, George, that I'm being too open <laughs> and too honest, but hopefully it's, it's working. Workplace resiliency. I had to think about this a lot. 
I think because I think it's changed into over the course of my career. And I'd love to, if I can ask you all what you think about workplace resiliency as well. I think for me in the past, it used to be resiliency meant you don't complain, you put your head down, you know, you get the, the job done no matter what. You just push, 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 push. And I think part of the reason I felt that way was because my parents did hard labor their whole life. Both my dad still is still working. He's 69 and he's still working. He's a garbage man. It's a very hard job. He gets up at 3 30 in the morning every day. <laughs> it used to be six days a week. And he is, he's dad strong. Like he has muscles in his legs and his arms, but he's tired. His knees are broken down, right? But I think for me, when I compare the work that we do behind a computer, right? I'm like, oh no, no. Like I'm just using my brain. Like he's using his brain and his body. I can just push through no matter what. So I think that's what I, I used to believe that's what it was. And I think in the last couple of years, I've changed my mind or I've had new experiences, right? Where I had kids six years ago. I have two, two kids now. And it, it made me realize that you can't just push, right? It's not, that's not a sustainable thing. And having kids force me to, you know, stop working so I could make dinner and then also eat dinner and get them in bed. But before I used to just push. So that was, I think the first thing that was eye opening for me. And then the second thing, which, you know, I think a lot of people that got laid off are probably having this aha moment that work can't be everything. It's you're not everything to them, right? So let's rethink what resiliency means. So those are the two, I think, big moments for me that had me pivot my, my thinking about it. And now what I think resiliency is, is how can you do excellent work? Because I believe in excellence, right? In a sustainable way that is benefiting obviously the company, I really do believe that like we're employees, right? The, the point is to grow whatever capital <laughs> you're working towards, but also in a way that you don't burn yourself out or your team out. Because if you do that, ultimately you will have to leave, right? Or you won't deliver that level of excellence anymore. So I no longer think it's saying yes to everything, pushing on everything. It's, I think having a critical mind about what you're going to prioritize, figuring out how you can have a sustainable life, whether it's working out, making bread, whatever pandemic <laughs> hobby you've held on to so that you can bring the majority of yourself to work, not your whole self, <laughs> the majority of yourself to work in a way that will still grow, you know, the capital for the business, but that you can still be a contributing person outside of work as well. That is brilliant. Uh, I just want to ask, I know you have a podcast, but are you writing a book by chance? Because your ideas are brilliant. Like I, I really do appreciate that. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking from a perspective of like a lot of my adult work experience was in England and coming to um, the US, corporate America is a whole different beast. And me sort of having to like pivot or rethink so many things and how what I've presented myself, or this is what workplace resiliency means. I had to change a lot of my thought process in order to what perform, make sure that I'm not only doing that, but taking care of things at home as well. So you sharing them is like, oh, wow, that's that was me a couple of years ago, having to like rethink how I present myself. So I appreciate that. Can I ask you, so where have you landed now? So I've landed in a sense where I just want to be optimal across, you know, uh, every, every facet, like, you know, be a top performer in my job at the same time, making sure I come home and my wife still thinks I'm the best thing since sliced bread. You know, that's the most important thing. I love that. That's a great answer. <laughs> hey, I wanted to switch things up. Um, I know with Dapper Dollars, we talked about finance as well. And then maybe listeners are wondering, hey, how does this resilience talk relate to financial well-being? I know a lot of people get directly impacted financially because they have to go through a layoff and then try to figure out, you know, what's their safety net during that recovery period. So, I mean, what was your experience like that um, going through? It sounds like you've gone through a lot of successful careers and it's like, like certain titles, of course, you know, like let's be transparent, like those salaries are pretty high and nice. And also about the same time, being financially responsible, you know, it, it's it goes in all places where some people aren't financially responsible or not. Yeah, I'm just curious to know about being financially responsible or not, or like how did that situation work out? So you're asking me if I'm responsible with my money, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. So here's the thing. I would say yes, but not on purpose. And I would encourage people to be yes and on purpose. I think for myself, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. My parents did the best they possibly could. And we never were in a situation where we didn't have, you know, clothes on our back and that sort of thing. But it definitely was money was always on my mind. It was, I'm going to go to college. And my goal was as soon as I graduate, I will never ask my parents for any financial help. 
I will not do that to them. And then eventually at some point in my life, I'll be able to give back was my mentality, right? But at least don't take anything more from them. And this was not because they ever told me that they didn't want help. In fact, they always offer, but it's just, I love them so much. I respect them. I I'm so thankful for what they've given to me and my two brothers so far that I didn't want to be a burden, even though they didn't view us that way. Right. So that was always my mentality. So I definitely have a, what does my cousin say? A scarcity mindset (laughs) when it comes to things. I never spent a bonus check that I got. It always went into savings or, you know, whatever account we had designated for it. As you know, and but I'll say it for the listeners as well, in tech, your compensation is usually a base salary, some kind of performance uh, bonus at the end that's calculated based on how you perform that year, right? And also how the company performed. And then at least for the large companies, right? Until startups like equity packages. And so I pretended that that equity just also didn't exist. I never spent it. I never sold it. I never did any of these things. Now that worked out really well for me (laughs) because I always pretended that I didn't have a lot of money. And so when I decided where we were going to rent and then eventually, you know, buy our first condo and then our house, it was with this mindset of imagine you have less than you have. The one thing I did spend a lot on, which I will own up to is my kids' birthday parties, but that's more because I'm Mexican (laughs) and we like you know, having a taco guy and a big piñata, like you feed everybody a lot and it's a big party. And so that's the one place where I definitely go all out. But other than that, I try to be pretty conservative with that. Now, the my advice to the people would be, that worked out for me because I worked at Google. And if you look at the history of Google stock price, it went up, 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 up. They split a couple of times, right? It just, it was a good choice to just not look at it. Had I been somewhere else, I wouldn't have been in such a great financial situation potentially. So I would say my advice to people is, don't overextend yourself. It's super easy to do that, especially when you start running in circles where there's always going to be people that make more money than you and they're having fancy vacations or whatever it is. Definitely enjoy yourself and find things that you want to spend your money on, but always operate from, at least, you know, my opinion, from a place of this could go away. And if it goes away, will you and your family be okay? And that was my family is my number one thing. So I always want to make sure that I'm making choices that protect them for the long run. Nice. I like that. And also because like you said, it prepare yourself. So you never know what can happen. And I like how you said, I don't even think about the equity aspect and I don't think about, well, maybe the bonus you, you can, but like the, just looking at those two are great indicators of what you can really rely on. So you can kind of do your calculations and see how much cash flow you have and all that. I do want to be fair though. I would say that not everyone has that luxury, right? I think some people have, they're the sole breadwinner or whatever it may be. And I have friends who are taking care of their parents, like they're paying for their their parents' mortgages. So I know not everyone can do that. But if you're in a position where you really can make those choices, I would encourage people to always underspend. I agree. So my question comes from really wanting to understand the perspective because we've seen trends like, you know, from the great, great resignation of a a couple of years ago to the big, you know, layoffs that happened across not just tech, but so many in industries. And so from your experiences, do you feel companies are doing enough to insulate or prepare their employees for these kind of experiences that's happened? Like due to like funding or like, hey, we have, we're looking to like cut costs. Like, do you feel companies are doing enough to help employees prepare? That's also a very good question, George. I would say my my answer is no, but I have a couple of thoughts, right? I think the first question I would ask is, do we think a company has a responsibility to even prepare us, right? What is the role of the company there? And I think people have different points of view there. I would say that, especially in tech, right? Most of us are highly educated. (laughs) We got through life to this point. I do think it's on our own responsibility as well to figure out what's happening in the market and are we preparing ourselves because at the end of the day, it's a company. So I think that's my higher level answer, but I would think I would say specifically with Google and I'll speak for myself, I was blinded. I made the mistake of believing that Google was not a public company (laughs) with thousands of employees. I was so loyal to them. And I know this is a very common sentiment within Googlers as well. I was there for nine years, right? I have friends that have been there for 15 plus years. You think it's a family. You think that you will be taken care of no matter what. And that was a mistake. I shouldn't have thought that, right? But the reason I also did think that was because in the past, Google has made certain choices to take care of people as much as they can, as much as they could, right? And so in this case, for whatever reason, they made the choice that the layoff was the most viable, you know, responsible decision to make to stakeholders, to 
employees that get to stay, whatever it is. Right. But I don't think that people are prepared. I think in an ideal world, Google specifically would have been more transparent to say, we are doing everything we can to build a sustainable business. And we might have to make some difficult choices that include, you know, reducing our workforce, but they never said that. And it wasn't until the very end. And so people were shocked, but again, what does a company owe us? You know, they're, they're not our parents. They're not our spouses. <laughs> they're not even our friends, like the company. Right. And so I think it behooves us to protect ourselves. And that doesn't mean quiet quitting or, you know, whatever the trends are right now. That's not what I mean. I mean, making sure your finances are in order. Are you working on the most high impact projects that you possibly can be? Are you taking care of your health, you know, your mental and physical health, the well-being of your family, so that if a company chooses to end its relationship with you, you can bounce back? I appreciate that, especially like, you know, so my two M cents on that would be, again, speaking to what we represent here with Dapper Dollars, where we're looking to have people understand that money is actually where money is actually understanding everything how it, ha it happens your habits like you know managing it well so again that ability to understand money and how it works for, for, for you is so important and again because you never know that's so inevitable you could be the top performer but going to the office one day and you get an email and if you haven't prepared yourself well or your family well that's where the trouble starts and that's what we're trying to actually you know preach and close that gap on how finances should actually work best for you. So I, I appreciate you. And speaking of money as well, um, what did you feel like, what were some key lessons you learned from the entire experience that you wish you had known before? I knew this, but I think it's worth saying anyway, because I didn't know it early in my career. The biggest thing is maxing out your 401k. <laughs> it's such an easy, I think, because I think finance is so overwhelming to people, right? And there's also this gender gap. I have a friend who works in um, in finance and she is all over her finances. She understands everything, how she can make her money work for her. And she tells me stories about how sometimes a lot of women that she knows don't even know the passwords to access their accounts. They just rely on their partner, you know, to, to, to do that. And so I think for me, when I'm reflecting on what tips I can give people, it's what are the, what's like the lowest hanging fruit for things for people to just do. And like the immediate one that comes to mind is maxing out your 401ks. I didn't do it initially. And I regret that. <laughs> but once I quickly learned it really was free money, go ahead and do that. I think that's one of them. I think the other one is definitely know where your money is. I will, again, what is what is my brand? What did Was it George who said it? Like, I'm very transparent. Uh, when I was at Nike, I literally forgot I had certain money some in, in accounts. And years later, they, you know, that company, that financial company emailed me was like, Oh, you have this money. And I was embarrassed. Right. And it wasn't a ton of money, but what am I doing? Right. It's my money. I worked for it. So know where your money is, be aware of it. Um, give yourself some kind of milestones or timeline around, okay, I have these goals that I want to hit by this age and write them down. And then also have you know, what we have is like a spreadsheet that shows how our money has grown over every year so that you have a sense of, are you going to that goal? And then the final thing I would say is, especially if you're working for some of these big companies, a lot of them offer free financial planners. So we were able to do that. And this financial planner, after a couple of sessions, created a couple of uh, models that said, if, you're, if your earning potential is this, this is when you can retire, that sort of thing. And also, even if we don't want to retire, it's a night, it opens up conversations around what are your financial goals? Like, do you believe in FIRE? What does that stand for again? Financially independent, retire early. There you go. You Maybe you believe in that and you want to do that. But I think where I landed on is I don't, I want to be conservative with my money in the sense of not spending it too much, but I, also, I like to work. And so I'm not necessarily having this goal that I need to retire in five years, but some people might want to do that. And so I think it's good for you to talk to both yourself and your partner um, about what your financial goals are. That response in itself kind of gave a lot of listeners confidence just because people that are right now listening through this conversation and just hearing about your background and where you're coming from and then how you've educated yourself. Because if you paint a picture of finance and money management, you'll think of a wealthy white male, right? Correct. Who knows money, who's been understanding from their past on generations of uh, knowledge. And I'm glad that you've mentioned that it's just financially empowering yourself by take advantage of the resources that's already given to you and take advantage of those low hanging fruits because it's, it's there. It's just the fact that you have to make your personal action and make it happen and you can take control of your finances. 
it can be overwhelming and intimidating, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's like something that like I, I did my undergrad in engineering and then go into business and learning finance. And I've always thought finance was going to be the more complicated subject out of all the business subjects. But I just realized that it's a lot of jargon that they make it overcomplicated, <laughs> yeah. but it all means the same thing, but they're multiple <laughs> 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 no, it sounds smarter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really does. It really does. I, I want to unpack something you um, said. There was a key uh, thing I caught in in your previous conversation. You said you mentioned we a lot. So I'm guessing that to interpret, am I right to interpret in that to be the partnership within you and your husband in terms of like, yeah. I really do appreciate that because like I've had that fortune. So I've lived in in three continents so seeing how money is being perceived uh, like from a family perspective and you know as always sometimes that silo mentality but it seems you the both of you have a partnership as to us uh, how do we as a family as a unit handle money uh can, can can you share like how was that like an agreement you had starting from the get-go or was that something you built in hmm interesting you're right. I guess it, that doesn't need to be the default. I'm trying to reflect on why that was the default for me. I think it came from my parents. You know, both of my parents worked, but sometimes my mom wouldn't work. And my parents would always jokingly, like every Friday, my dad would hand over the check to my mom and then they'd go and cash it. And then she would jokingly give him money for the week, right? It was like a joke. It was like, a, <laughs> cause he said, he's like, I love you so much and all my money is for you and I'm working for you. And so I think for me, it just, it instilled in me of we're a family unit and sometimes my mom will work. Sometimes she wouldn't, but she's also working in the household and everyone's contributing in different ways. And so it was always instilled in me of we're a family. And so what's yours is mine and what's mine is yours. And so I think it's really important that you're finding a partner who like, if that's how you, if that is a mentality that you have, I think it's important to find a partner that also agrees with that mentality and understands that there's different ways that people are contributing to the family over time. And sometimes someone is a higher earner, and then maybe maybe it'll flip, but we're all taking care of each other always. And there has to be trust there. And I think also similar spending habits, <laughs> right? You know, if, <laughs> if one person's a little fancier, then you might have, you know, might have an issue. So I think we never ran into those issues, right? Of I think we're pretty aligned on how we spend our money. And sometimes when I have a big birthday party, I let them know, hey, I want to spend a little extra here, <laughs> you know? Um, and so we have those conversations, but I, I do think that may not be the answer for everyone, right? I think um, my advice to people would be just be open about those conversations and say where you're coming from and why, and also be okay with maybe it changes, right? Maybe we all have a joint account at some point and then five years down the line, because people's earning potentials have changed and the relationship has changed. Maybe you decide you separate that, but just be open about it and be aligned. So Good stuff. Good stuff. I really do appreciate that. So one thing I really did find when I researched about you was just like your wealth of experience. You worked for companies like Nike, Mc McKinsey, um, YouTube. Um, obviously, you've experienced workplace culture within those those companies you've worked with. And from your from what you've seen, what you lived, um, would you say workplace culture actually affects or directly impacts workplace resiliency within the employees? I think absolutely. I think absolutely. And again, I'm going to ask what you all think about this too. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. I think that not only is it the company culture itself, but it's also specifically the org culture that you're in and also the team specifically, because these companies are so large that I've had different experiences, depending who is my manager, who is the leadership of that specific, specific organization. I think when I think about workplace resiliency, the biggest thing that impacted for me was, and I know this is such a buzzword, but I think it's an effective buzzword. It's psychological safety. Right. Do you feel that when you are in an organization, you can speak up when something is going off the rails? You know, whether it's the way that someone's being coached or the, the projects being prioritized, whatever it may be, can you speak up? Right. And I think in some organizations that I've been in, you can't. There's going to be retaliation or they're going to think you're a complainer, whatever it is. Right. And so you're going to be discouraged to, to speak up to the right thing. I will give it a shout out to McKinsey. I know consultants get a bad rap. <laughs> especially when they go in house, you know, I know we're intense, that sort of thing. There's a reason why we're intense though, in terms of the way that the work gets done. But one of the things that at the time that McKinsey really promoted was, what was it called? It was obligation to dissent. Are you familiar with that at all? So th they had a couple of, you know, rule, like a rule book of how, how we work and why we work. And it wasn't just 
be comfortable dissenting. It was, you had an obligation because in McKinsey, we would be hired for, you know, a project that could be just a couple of weeks and you're being brought together with people that maybe you have never worked with before. And you're solving a problem in an industry that maybe you are just ramping up on a company you're ramping up on, and you have to deliver a very thorough (laughs) checked out recommendation to this company that's hired you. And so every minute counts. And if you see something going off the rails, you need to raise your hand right away because if you don't, everything can fall apart. And so we were, it didn't matter if you were a week into the job or, you know, five years in the job, everybody had an obligation to dissent. And I took that with me everywhere else that I went after that, but you have to be careful, right? Because if you're constantly raising your hand and saying, "Mm, actually, we forgot this. If the, if the organization doesn't want to hear that and is not equipped to have that mentality, you're going to stop doing it. And then over time, then you get into another buzzword, which is group think, <laughs> right? But I think that's what it is. I think it's organization, like psychological safety. Can I actually agree that the people around me care about me and that they know I care about them and therefore that we're working towards the best solution for this business or organization that we're, we're pushing on? Um, I just kind of blanked out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> keep that in, keep that in. <laughs> I was also going to add, add, add to that. So with the company I work for, um, so on, we have one of the leadership principles, which is having a backbone, which like, hey, you know, you go into meetings and feel free to always speak up. And, you know, this analysis doesn't feel right. You don't have to like be that yes, yes person to every time. Like, hey, this is wrong. And you are actually encouraged to um, do um, that in everything. And I really do appreciate that because in the end, that fosters that ability that, hey, my voice is actually heard, you know, in everything. And the reason I love that is because if it's the organization saying that, then George, when you're in the meeting and you tell the person, I have questions about your analysis, that person doesn't think, oh, George is trying to one up me. He he wants my job. He's trying to get promoted. It's no, no, he has my back. And he knows that if I, if he doesn't speak up here, when I go to the higher level and show my analysis, it might be off. You know what I mean? So it's this it's this mutual agreement of we have each other's back and you're not trying to hurt someone, you know? So that's why it's important that the organization is saying it versus just you, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Hey, I'm actually curious to know, like, what did you feel like right now has been your secret to success um, in a workplace or just in life? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Thank you for calling me successful. <laughs> What's my secret to success? Wow. I mean, that's like, I feel like if I answer that, it sounds really conceited. <laughs> No, I mean, like, you're like, oh, I'm so successful. Here's my secret. Uh, (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak my truth. Honestly, I think it's how I treat people. I think that it's, I really think that matters so much. Like, how do you treat other people? And then it also goes back to how do you talk to yourself? Right. And I think I, every time I enter, I think I've said this in my own podcast, right. But every time I enter any sort of interaction with a human being, I see it as an opportunity to make an actual connection and make it a positive one. Right. And so during my time at work, whether if I was at McKinsey and I was meeting clients, I wanted to get to know them. I know I was only there for a couple of weeks, but I want to know that who they are, what their goals are. And so they can, they can know who I am as well. And so then we create this rapport and it's a genuine rapport. Right. And so then we can work together more effectively. Then when I was at, you know, Nike, Google, YouTube, et cetera, and I was managing teams, I invested a ton of time in people's career development Anytime someone reached out to me randomly, even if they weren't on my team and they wanted to have any sort of chats, I always say yes, because I just think the point of life is getting to know each other and helping each other out as much as we can. And so that's the secret sauce. I think the rest of it still needs to be there, right? I still need to be really awesome at my job. I need to dissent, object, whatever word we're, we're using, right? When something's going off the rails, but because I've built those relationships and when I do those, when I have those tough conversations with people or ask the tough questions, they know it's coming from a place of love and not a place of judgment. And so I do think it matters how we treat each other. And that's how I go through life. I'm glad you said that because I feel like I've heard similar answers like that from very successful people. And it's, it's like, I don't know. I, I think it's a, it's such an attribute that you can ease, fix easily if you don't have that. And it just seems like, because I've heard this from like a leader at at and she's climbed her way up. Like she's an absolute rock star. And what she told me is like, it's, it's not like about how many networking events you can attend. It's about how do you work with that person? How do you develop that genuine connection? And they really get to understand what your work ethic is, what your intentions are 
how you treat others. And so that becomes the reality of how they're going to be perceived as amongst like other people when they climb the ladder, you know? I love that. I think if I want to give someone, cause you said that it's something that can easily be fixed and some listeners might say, actually, that's really hard for me, right? <laughs> it's hard for me to get to know people. And, and I, I agree, right? It's, it does come easy to me. One thing that you could do though, that I've always carried through all of my teams is creating working norms. It's a simple doc. You can put whatever questions you want in it, but the questions that I would add would be things along the lines of, you know, what are the things that give you energy? What are the things that take away your energy? What are some non-negotiables for you? So for me, when I was working in San Bruno, California, but living in San Francisco, I had to take a shuttle home every day at a certain time to go pick up my kids from school. I had to. So that was a non-negotiable, right? But then I was willing to get back on the computer after that. So I think being very, using a working norms doc or even a working norms conversation to say, this is how I work. And I will try to be as flexible to your working style as, as possible, but just even just being very transparent about what you need is like an easy thing that people can do, even if you feel like you're awkward or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I'll say, I think that is such a, an emerging leadership style. I'll, I'll say my experience, every leader I've worked under, and I feel like, Hey, I would go to the bat for this person has always been that person who has made time to get to know me and who I am and what I bring to the table. And I feel empathy is starting to grow and just adding to part of your EQ, your emotional intelligence. So it's a good thing that I saw that you were actually practicing this as a leader with the companies you work because, you know, I, 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 and again, I think it speaks to who you are as a person. And uh, I do want to add though, importantly, um, but the fact that you experienced a layoff and you're able to pivot and you're now a podcast host then, you know, if you can get to share a perspective for those who actually did experience that, that layoff and are still, you know, in that position in their life where, you know, they're still picking up pieces and thinking about what's next, what the next step could possibly be. Um, could you share a perspective on or solve like way forward with things on that? Yeah, I think interestingly, I started the podcast three days after I got laid off. <laughs> and I just... I needed, I'm the kind of personality that in order to work through my feelings, I feel like I need to be productive. And so I said, okay, I'm going to do this project. And then I also, I think a lesson for me was there's so much power in being creative. And as we get older, we lose either the time or the interest or both, right? To be that. But there's a reason why kids have recess and why kids love art and are, are make believe and are constantly making up stories. Like there's a reason why it makes us happier. Right. So I think one piece of advice to people just as a blanket of, even if you've never felt like you've been creative in your life, you probably have been in the past when you were younger and see if there's anything that could be a creative outlet for yourself that maybe is less work than a podcast. <laughs> maybe try something else. <laughs> um, but I do think that's really important that that really helped me out. So for people that are still picking up the pieces, what helped me, I, not just the podcast, but also telling people how I felt whether it was my parents, my brothers, my friends, my partner, and just being very vulnerable and honest and saying, these are my insecurities. Because I think depending on who the person you're talking to, they'll either validate you or uplift you. And people have different skills too, right? When they're comforting people. So tell as many people as you feel comfortable, right? To, to get those feelings that I think is really important. And then the second thing I would say is, try not to rush back into it. If you have the luxury, right? Like I knew people that were on visas and they had to find a job immediately. And so again, this is coming from a place of privilege where I didn't have to immediately go looking. But if you, if you are in that position, really think about what you want to do next and don't feel pressured to, to jump at the first opportunity. That being said, people are continuing to be laid off. Companies are now doing reorgs as a way to lay more people off. And I have been talking to friends recently who are job searching now that it is a more challenging environment. Whereas in the past, they might've gotten a phone screen right away just because they were referred. That's not automatically the case anymore. So it's a trade-off, right? But I think I really do believe that this is a moment in time. And if you have set yourself up financially where you can give yourself a little bit more runway, then use that runway to think about what you want in your next phase, whether it's more money or more of a passion project or more flexibly, whatever it is, so you can make the right choice for you. So don't do it out of a place of fear if you have that privilege not to do that. And I think um, this kind of 
closes off things. And I'm glad you also talk, talked about your creativity because I wanted to get into that. I know you mentioned in your, your show and how you've always had this creativity passion and your brother's pursuing it. He's a professor now for that. Um, so, I mean, what, so what's next for you? Like, uh, like, are you going to continue this podcast? Uh, any exciting other projects? Are you in the fingerprinting? Like, what, what, is, <laughs> what should people look that for? <laughs> so I gave myself the goal that I would do at least 10 episodes. And my 10th episode is launching next week. It's one of my best friends. His name is Steven. And I have, I think, five other ones I've already recorded. So I'm going to surpass my goal. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> And honestly, um, I'm going to start looking for jobs in the, in the months ahead. And because I do miss that environment where you're working on something that's bigger than yourself. I miss coaching people. I love it so much. I just get so much joy out of it. So I, I think I will be looking for a job, but I'm, I've made a commitment to myself that I will keep the podcast going because I'm getting so much out of it. And honestly, I've gotten like random outreach from people that I've never met people in other countries, even that say I was laid off or I had this experience or this resonates with me. And Obviously, it means so much when my family and friends also love it. But when someone I've never met says, wow, I, I felt seen by your story or I got strength from your story. I'm inspired by this or that. It's so freaking cool <laughs> that it's worth everything, right? It's worth all the work, going to bed late to, to do the editing on the podcast, that sort of thing. And so I want to keep it going. And then sometimes I, I'd write stories that I don't finish because writing is really hard. But, you know, it's fun to try. <laughs> Please do it. Continue it. Like... I think that's how we kind of met and it was awesome. Like just listening to your episodes, they're, they're hilarious, especially for the topic that it is, uh, you bring a light to it. And like, I think I've mentioned to you, like just from, even from the theme song, it's a calming and like looking at the same time. And then just the, the one hour goes by so fast because you're so engaging and it's, it's a really good show. So I hope you continue that too. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. And it's such a niche podcast to have because you are giving validity to people's experiences. A lot of people experience like the whole, the layoffs and the reorgs and you get into have conversation after conversation and people opening up about like, this was my experience. This was how I was able to bounce back. This was my pivot experience too as well. So that was really cool. So I know we've spoken about um, Nisi, the, the podcaster, you know, ex Google, you know, ex YouTube, ex Nike. Um, so how is Nisi the mom to to two kids and i know school is about to start like so how is everything with the home like so i have two kids my daughter jordan is six my son leo is four jordan started first grade i think about two weeks ago now and she's already had um two sleepovers <laughs> which is, and she just is living her best life and i just i can't believe it right because a couple of years ago she just wanted to be on my lap so but she's doing great uh we're we live in san diego and we moved from the bay area right after the pandemic just to give them a uh, more access to to good schools and to, to be able to play and that sort of thing and my son leo will be starting kindergarten next year so me see the mom i would say i said family is the most important thing to me and i think my kids are actually the number one most important thing to me and I also said that I think the purpose of life is to make connections, but I do think my personal goal in life was, or, you know, purpose was to be a mother. So I'm living my best life, just being their mom. And I have taken this opportunity of having more flexibility by not having a full-time job where I can take them to play dates when they need to, right? I can pick them up early um, and spend quality time with them and not feel rushed when I'm trying to put them to sleep and they won't go to sleep because I have a deadline, right? So I'm really embracing this time and I am very thankful for that. I am very thankful. It's a very nice byproduct of my current situation. <laughs> I'm sure the quinceanera is going to be extravagant. <laughs> you have um, no uh, idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, how can the listeners stay connected? I love it. I can't, I'm already planning a quinceanera. I love that you know that about me. Um, so it's um, at Nisi Duran, N-I-C-Y-D-U-R-A-N um, for Instagram. That's where I'm probably most active, where you'll, you'll also find clips there and links to the one of a kind podcast. So yeah, I would love to stay connected with your listeners. Please check out upcoming episodes. Start from the beginning. If you want to hear me really devastated on the first episode after I got laid off, I'm in a better place now. <laughs> and finally, we want to thank our listeners who have supported us. By the way, let us know in the comments below if you've gone through a layoff before and how did you bounce back? We would love to get a discussion going to share your personal experiences.
By the way, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you leave us a review on where you listen to your podcast. And don't forget to share this episode on social media. Just don't forget to tag us on at dapper.dollars on Instagram and TikTok. Now, if you want more gems like this, make sure to head over to dapperdollars.com. Scroll down to a blog to access our show notes from this podcast. And last but not least, don't forget to look good, feel good, and do good. See you at the next episode. Bye, y'all. Wanna hear you go?